Games. They are either depicted as toys for children, unsocial nerd culture, or a phase that ended too soon. It needed a Witcher to build a PC to lift gaming to a serious level. Here, the far-fetched intro stops and we combine the two words I just said, serious games. Before I start breaking down the components, let me separate different words. E-learning, or rather digital learning, means the usage of technology in order to fulfill a learning strategy, as in kickstarting the learning process but still focusing on linear learning. Then we have entertainment as a terrific word combination when the terms entertainment and education married to underline this mixture. Although the learner is rather passive. You might know some TED Talks with that characteristics and some fairly similar format with a British guy. Nice shiny glass desk, John. Game-based learning approaches focus on the playful side of learning and not on the learning process itself. Think of learning software you were forced to do as a kid. Could you think of something greater than going on a learning adventure with a cousin of the Cookie Monster? Yeah, me neither. I could go on now with showing you different kind of adventures, examples, alien explorations, mathematical pirates and what not. Point is, the market is huge. In the year 2018, the overall size was estimated to be 3.5 billion US dollars for entertaining media with the purpose of learning. Some think tanks estimate the future market size to be seven times that. And sure, those thinkers usually draft their research for the actual client. But if you look on a related industry, namely esports, those billion figures seem to be somewhat realistic. As for the nuances between those three, yes, definitions are blurry and an industry-wide definition is not given. Showing the age of the term series gaming, this is somewhat surprising as Carl Kapp from Growth Engineering points out that the term exists since the 1970s. A lot of people think that the term serious games originated in 2000 with the serious, around 2000 with the Serious Games Initiative, Ben Sawyer and David Rajeski. But that's not the case at all. If we go back in time to the 1970s, a gentleman named Clark Abbott actually created a book called Serious Games. He then continues to the earliest remarks of Serious Gamings in the 1700s. Seems like the desire to play and to learn is rather old. I checked several authors and sources and found four characteristics that keep showing up. First up is the primary reason why we play. And it is not merely for fun or entertainment or killing time. We play to build competencies, to level up, if you will. So no, no, Jordan, your really important poker tournament is not serious gaming. You're supposed to get better at it. Now, three side conditions come into play. First, we assume that the learners are here voluntarily. Everybody who ever had to give tutor lessons within their own family knows it. You cannot force learning process. Second, Besides fact and domain knowledge, social and soft skills are important as well. Imagine you sit in a negotiation game, such as the Harvard oil price simulation. Automatically and subconsciously, you learn something about body language. Third, the game itself can only represent so much of the reality. And we learned that from computer games early on. Even hyper-realistic games, such as Plague Inc. and the political process, have to simplify or shorten, otherwise they would be too hard to play or just plain boring. A serious game then has to make the hard decisions what part of the reality it simulates and what is left out or abbreviated. In any way, since enough of the original process is left, the players will pick up process knowledge about the game of the scenario that they are playing. Similar to friendship ending rounds of Monopoly, Serious games need a game cycle. Garris and other researchers include three phases into that. Behavior of the player, feedback and evaluation, and motivation to continue playing. In practice, you know that from board games night. 
some dude comes with a game you've never heard of, the rules are somewhat complex, and then he says, let's start, I will show you along the way. Through the game cycle, the knowledge and skills are built up naturally, almost subtle. So these are our two ground pillars. We play for various competencies and we play more than one round. The third pillar is the decision between cooperation and competition. Some series games are designed to be played as group versus group or player versus player, but some are entirely co-op based. You either play together against the bank or the time. Think about the escape rooms or educational breakouts. Both are very good examples for classroom integration by giving the game so much room and make the class or lecture entirely about it, you change the class and learning scenario entirely. At the same time, you dust off the cliché the cliche of the unsocial, unhealthy gamer. I mean, come on, look at The Witcher. Making learning progress visible is another point. Often game designs include some sort of ranking, levels or a reward system. But rankings and rewards are not enough to make it serious. These nuances underline the necessity of a cross-faculty approach in order to design a successful serious game. You need didactics, game developers, designers, education experts, and depending on the subject, field experts. If you know, if you think now, yeah, that's a lot, yeah, and we just touched the surface. One of the most important points, and therefore it is inherently part of the game cycle, is the feedback part. In a video game, feedback is a built-in feature. No level ups, no new stages, unless you beat the game. In an academic or educational setting, things get tricky. We all know those case studies that are just very long text questions with pseudo context. And after a two hour session, which is totally not enough for a serious game, the students are done and think, okay, what now? Lunch, I guess? The point is, serious games need a debriefing, a chance to normalize the knowledge and to speak about the, uh, to speak about the experience. This is not an esoteric vibe, like when your aunt Joan told you to use a healing crystal. This is a necessity. If you don't debrief, you leave your students in the dark, whether they picked up all the same results and reasons and why a specific result was achieved. And we'll not know what they took away from it. Since you will go into the evaluation phase more than once, try to standardize it. Make it clear that feedback in both directions is necessary. The feedback loop is actually the biggest strength of these games, because in reality we don't have these feedback loops. Alright, enough with the theories and mechanisms behind it, let's talk about examples and implementations. In the professional and corporate sphere, agile frameworks gain in popularity and it's already mind-blowing for some companies to adapt instead of writing concepts for a year and doing one big swoop like a waterfall of requirements that is hitting the dev team hard. You can think of two hipster trend topics that are united and bring out the best in each other, agile workflows and serious games. As an example, let's have a look on Scrum with Lego blocks. I mean, who would play with colorful construction kits and build an actual working differential? No way. But you heard it right. Grown-up human beings, also known as adults, meet, play with Lego and other construction material, and the best part of it, they actually pay for it, because serious games are serious business. The game itself needs a facilitator, usually a third-party coach, each scrum team has a scrum master, like a team captain, and then five to nine players per group, as in the official scrum framework. With various teams, you can easily play with 20 to 40 people. Scrum itself has a scaled version, so you could play and teach Scrum with an entire cohort of students. And think of it, instead of showing 100 slides of a framework that is supposed to be done and applied, you show your students 10 slides and actually do it. Usually the overall goal is to build a city with different requirements, needs, changing from round to round. Each round, the team estimates the necessary time to complete another building or part according to the definition of done. The five days of a working week are simulated by five minutes. 
meaning that one month of a sprint translates back to 20 minutes. Together with introduction, the trial phase, feedback, the setup time and so on, you easily fill 140 minutes. That time frame does not fit in a regular lecture. Right now, when things get interesting, you and your class would have stopped. Imagine the situation. The bell rings and your students do not want to leave the lecture hall. Every teacher's dream. I participated once at a scrum version like this and I can tell you, it is getting stressful. You think you play a little for a day and you drink coffee and eat cake, but when the intro ends and you see the other teammates rolling up their sleeves to get things done, you forget the cake. You want to win. Once the simulation is over, I left with thousands of new impressions and a real understanding what Scrum is. Since I already mentioned analog and digital representatives, it should be clear that serious games are not entirely bound to one medium or another. In fact, you could use them both, the real physical world and digital tools to enrich them, like geocaching. Running out in the wild, setting or finding caches of others by using GPS and other tools. Purely digital series games are more and more used in the health sector. Either for therapeutic application, like movement and recreational therapy, or for simulating the process of a hospital. This change has to do with the logistics of the training. Medical students need time to adjust to the emergency room and to the clinical daily business. They come from a packed curriculum and are thrown into the real deal of being a medical professional. At the same time, an ER is not a place to take a break, looking up something in the how to save life for dummies and continue. So the health sector came together with a software studio and they created Emerge. Additionally, they conducted surveys and studies about the reception and success of the game. Conclusion? Higher test results compared to problem-based learning groups. The given academic literature is even ready for its own meta-analysis. What we see here is the creation of a new ecosystem, joining forces to create something that is beneficial for each interest group. Universities with professors, lecturers and students, the creative and software industry, and finally the sector which features the respective game. Arguably, the industry has one or more dollars to earn in it, and here in Berlin, a whole line of agencies and media consultancies offer services regarding serious games. And yes, creating serious games, digital or analog, is a lot of work. But it, and it has a higher bar than creating a PowerPoint or traditional learning media. You need learning goals, competencies, feedback loops, cross-faculty members, and time to actually implement and improve your game. But all these features should be present in a modern classroom anyway. I would argue that the effort is worth because the learning is more sustainable than traditional approaches. I would even advocate that designing a game together with students in a seminar is applicable. You cannot do it alone anyways. It's worth your time, it's, a, it's worth all the time of these students and it's worthy of that extra mile. If you need more resources, examples and hints of different games, everything is linked below. Let me know what you think and let me know what you play. Thank you.